My name is Stanislaw Robert Liberto with AV Ultra, and today we're going to be learning about Apple Motion. Here's something that we're going to end up creating in Apple Motion here. So I've got a little bit of a background. So you can see we've got our text coming in, a little logo, we had some reflection in there. All right, that looks great. Before we go ahead and jump in on this, let's talk about exactly what motion is. So I'm gonna close this out here. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to launch motion here. Motion is an animation program, a compositor, a motion graphics tool, and a tool that I can use for VFX. It's very comparable to, let's say, After Effects. So why would I want to use Motion instead of After Effects? Well, there's a couple reasons. One, if I'm working with Final Cut Pro, uh, Motion plugs right into it. In fact, a lot of the tools that I use in Motion end up in Final Cut. So a lot of the graphics or effects happen on the fly in Final Cut and I can render very quickly. It's kind of a pipeline between those, very similar to say uh, After Effects and Premiere working together. Another reason is price. So if I pull up my Creative Cloud experience here and I want to buy a copy of After Effects, unfortunately I can't just buy it and own it. The best I can do is something that I like to call renting the software uh, once a month. And if I want just After Effects, that's going to run me 20 bucks a month. If I want to use, say, After Effects and Premiere, which I typically do a lot, that actually runs me $50 a month here. Now, there are different plans for businesses and students and teachers. So because I actually am an instructor over at a couple colleges, uh, you know, typically I fall into something like this. However, uh, in the past, I've definitely had to use this option here. So this is about $50 a month. And so let's say just even 12 months there, you're looking at about 600 bucks for uh, the program. Now, if I'm buying Motion, I have a total one-time cost of $49.99. So why wouldn't everybody just use motion? Well, one, most people just equate video effects with After Effects or let's say a different program like Nuke. Now, motion for 50 bucks is a phenomenal price. There is so much I can do in motion that's quicker than if I tried doing it in After Effects. Things like particle generation or replicators in general are included and work extremely well in motion. A lot of the rendering that happens in motion is almost in real time, where if I'm in After Effects, I'm constantly reviewing bits and pieces of it to try and make things happen. Another really great feature is in the newer version of Motion here, we actually have 3D text. Now we've had 3D in After Effects with the Ray Tracer, uh, however, that's not really a good um, option, at least not for me. I've never gotten the ray tracer to work in a, in a situation where I feel really good about it. In fact, I feel it's so broken that they've included Cinema 4D Lite as part of After Effects package to kind of mitigate that issue with there. Now, I'm a huge fan of using Element 3D in After Effects, but you know, I don't have Element 3D in motion. So those are really the main differences. The last difference that's probably the most important is that Motion only works on Mac OS X. So if you have a Windows machine, you just can't use it. It's not built for it, it won't run, uh, don't ask for it because it doesn't exist. Where After Effects runs on Mac and PC, so a lot of environments may have both Mac and PC, that's going to be your option. So those are the main differences between Motion and After Effects. So I'm going to go ahead and I've launched Motion here from my dock here. It looks just like this guy. And as soon as I launch it, I'm brought to the project browser. And the project browser has all these different things on here. In fact, I've got a ton of these different options on the side here. You probably don't have that. You might have a few of these in our compositions here. We can review that. But the only thing we're going to talk about right now is this blank one, Motion Project. 
what this is setting up is kind of like the size of our canvas. So if I was in After Effects and I want to make something that's going to be in 1080p, I'm going to need to make it 1920 by 1080 and set up that composition. And here I can do that as well. So there are presets I can set up. So we have NTSC DV, presentations, broadcast, 4K, and then custom. So I can always set aside my own custom resolution. And if I have any kind of interlaced footage and aspect ratio. So I'm going to actually go to square here. In fact, I could just go to my broadcast 1080p and then my frame rate. Because I'm here in America, I'm going to go with 2997 and my duration is actually going to be six seconds. And I'm going to click open. As soon as I click open, I'm brought to a screen that's going to look almost identical to this, if not identical to this. So let's take a look at exactly what is in motion here. So the first thing you're going to notice is that I've got a big old black screen here. This is my canvas. In fact, I'm just going to draw out a shape here really quick. Here's my shape tool. And while we're not going to be talking too much about shapes right now, I just wanted to put something on the screen here. And as soon as I've done that, I've populated two areas here. I've populated my layers and I've populated my timeline here. My timeline works just like any other track editor or timeline based uh, nonlinear editor where this rectangle will exist from the very beginning of my timeline until the end of my timeline. And if I was in Premiere or Final Cut, I can shorten this to say maybe like that. And now if I play this back using my spacebar or my play control here, it's going to exist until about here and then that clip stops playing because it just doesn't exist past that point. Now you can see I've got this group here and a rectangle. So it's very interesting the way that motion will automatically kind of group things. I'm just going to get rid of this for right now so we can uh, take a look at something else. So we have our canvas here and this is our main output. We have our timeline, we have this layers panel here, and I have my file browser. So my file browser is looking at my computer just like uh, if you're browsing in your finder here. So I'm currently uh, looking at my desktop right now and I just have a folder there. And for our purposes, I'm going to jump into a specific folder I've got on my hard drive here that has uh, the icon I'm looking for. So I've got my program icons and right in here is my motion icon here. Now notice it gives me a little bit of a preview. It lets me know that it has an alpha channel and I can tell that because it says millions of colors plus there. Whenever we see that plus it usually means that there is alpha information in there. And if I go ahead and I click and I drag this over, notice I can put this in my layer panel and that's going to plop it right in the middle of my screen. I'm going to hit Command Z to undo that. I'm also going to go ahead and drag it into my timeline panel and that's done in an identical function there. And I can drag this right into my canvas and notice the difference here is when I put it into my canvas it lets me place it anywhere in my canvas whereas if I dragged it into my layers or my timeline it places it in the center of my canvas. One other thing to note is where it placed it in my timeline. Do you notice how it placed it right here at about the four second mark? The reason for that was my playhead was last in this area. So I can just take this icon or this group that it's in and just drag that back to the beginning of my timeline here. And it's just like as if I'm working with a clip in Final Cut or Premiere or in After Effects. So there is my icon there. So I can bring in different kinds of pictures, video, uh, graphics, and just place them right in. The other thing I want to talk about now is the library. One of the things that sets apart motion from After Effects is that it has a ton of stuff built in. Now, don't get me wrong, After Effects has a bunch of expressions and some backgrounds built in and those are kind of generative, right? They've, if I put in a caustics background there, it's going to have a certain shape and I can see that under my effects controls. Well, I have that too 
here in motion. So I have my generators, and notice I have generators, and I've got a few other ones here. So I've got this cellular or caustics. And these are just creatable kinds of backgrounds or things I want to work with. There's also a separate folder down here called content. And under content, there's just a ton of different stuff. Some of it's going to be a little bit more useful than others, but it's, I usually jump into this when I need stuff kind of created. So here's an arrow here, right? And you can see these arrows that are already pre-animated. So it's very easy for me to just throw together some graphics very, very quickly. For our purposes, I'm going to jump into the backgrounds here. And I'm going to go and I'm going to bring in gradient stage. And I can see what that looks like right here. And I'm just going to drag that and place that right into my layers. And now it's made a, another group here. So I have this gradient, this rectangle, which is another kind of icon. This is a shape icon. So I can create those custom shapes, just like I made that square before. This is basically a square. And this gradient is just a, a generator. A generator is just almost like a, a color solid in After Effects, where it's just, it exists on its own. And all that is contained within this group. You can think of groups as folders or pre-comps from After Effects. So currently, my gradient is above my group in the layer stack here and in my timeline. So if I go ahead and I grab this guy and I can go ahead and place him above it here. And now you can see my icon is above my gradient stage. And again, it looks like my playhead was here at the very middle of my timeline, that one I want. So I'm going to go ahead and drag that back. Now, this isn't looking the same way as my other one here. Yeah, I've got this gradient kind of background here, uh, but it's a different color and the shape is all weird. So if I want to change any of these things, I'm going to want to go into the inspector. And the inspector works very similar to Final Cut, where I can get in there and really monkey around with some different things. So currently, I'm looking at the group. So it's giving me information for everything contained within this group. It's almost like as if I'm doing an effect on a pre-comp in After Effects. I want to drill down, and I'm going to work with just this rectangle here. And as soon as I click Rectangle, you'll notice that my inspector is completely changed. So I've got my properties here, and this gives me my X and Y information. So you can see I can kind of move this back and forth, and that's pretty interesting. And I can rotate this or shear it. I have a tab here called Behaviors and Filters, which we haven't gotten into, but we'll get into a little bit later. And then my shape. And under my shape, I've got style and geometry. So we're just going to be working with our style here. And I have a gradient going across here. You can kind of see that. I've got it going from this black area to this whitish kind of tan pinkish thing here. I'm not too crazy about that color. I just want to make this kind of white gray. So I'm going to click on my color and open up my color swatch. And I'm just going to pick this gray that I've got here. And I'm going to lighten that up. And I'm going to do the same thing with this gradient. So I've selected this gradient. And notice I have properties, behavior filters. And instead of geometry or shape, I've got generator. And it's just asking, OK, how big is this thing? 1280 by 720, just like a color solid. And I have this color. And I'm just going to go ahead and click the same color. I don't remember exactly the hex value that I had for this, so I'm just going to grab this eyedropper, select it, and I'm going to make it just a tiny bit darker here to separate it from the background. All right. Now, this whole stage here, I can see the preview of it right there, is a little small. You can see I'm seeing the edges here, and I want to scale that up. Well, I'm just going to go under my properties and under scale, just scale that up. So I've made that quite large now. 
and I'm going to go ahead to this motion icon, right? And I've selected this guy here, and you can see it selected it here. And I'm just going to drag it maybe right about there. That looks pretty good. And now what I want to do is I want to make my text here. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to grab my text tool right here, and I'm just going to draw out an area. And in here, I'm just going to type out Apple motion and I'm going to click off of that. I can double click back into this and resize this little texture if I need to. I'm going to give myself a little extra room though so I can play with this font. Right now it's created a white font. By default it usually wants to go with white and it's using the last font choice I chose which was DDT. And in here, notice I'm still in my inspector. I've got my properties and behaviors and filters and I have this text field here. So I've clicked on this text field and here I can specify my size. Any line tracking if there's multiple lines. Any line spacing if I have multiple lines. Tracking and as soon as I hit that edge you can see it wants to hit a return and go into that next field. So I'm just going to go ahead and shrink this down just a, a little bit here. And I have some advanced things, so we can go ahead and scale the individual uh, text elements, monospace, all caps, etc. And it says editable in FCP, which what that means is if I publish this as a template, I'll be able to access this text in Final Cut. If I turn this off, then it just wouldn't be editable in Final Cut. So there's my Apple Motion, and I'm going to come back under my appearance here and notice I have a whole lot more options. So I can adjust the face color of my text. So perhaps I'm going to make this one uh, again just a little gray but I want it to stand out from the background so I'm going to give it a drop shadow. And in this drop shadow here I can give it some distance or some blur and you know what, let's make that text stand out a little bit more, make it a little wider there. And if I need to make this larger, I'll go back under the properties. I'll go under the text format. And I'll just have to make this text box a little bit larger. Now, I, want, I really like this same kind of format and everything, so I could just create another text layer here, or I can duplicate this layer. I'm a huge fan of duplicating something because it basically just takes all the different things I've done to this individual layer and just copies it. So if I want to duplicate this, I'm just going to go ahead and click off of it and select this layer so you can see it's selected in my timeline here. And I can just hit Command D or go to Edit Duplicate. It's going to do the same thing. And now I've got two of them there. So it looks a little bit darker because I have double the shadows. And I'm just going to take this guy and I'm just moving this puck, which just also happens to be its anchor point. And now I've made a second one. Now I'm just going to click this and change this to Tutorials. And here I'm going to work with this font. Maybe I don't want that color, so I'm going to change the appearance here. And instead of this whitish, maybe I'll make it a little purple. And I can adjust this tracking just a little bit here. And that's starting to look a little bit better. Now as individual items, I can go ahead and maneuver them. However, I've mentioned that because they're in a group, it's almost like a pre-comp. So I can click on this group and maneuver the whole group. So it's not just moving one layer or two layers, it's actually moving everything that's in this layer. And if I take a look on this layer group here, you can see I have these individual elements and that they're indented in this group here. Now I don't like the name group, so I've double clicked this and I'm just going to call this text and icon. And I'm, I don't like this grading stage, I'm just going to call this background. Alright, so that's starting to look pretty good. I need to maneuver this stuff a little bit more. If I need to uh, scale this guy up here. I've opened down this drop down and I've 
selected just this icon here and I can come into my scale and I can scale it up otherwise I can grab these control points here and if I just hold on to shift that's gonna let me scale that up all right now again notice what's happening in my timeline here I have this text and icon but my text layers are starting here because I had my time indicator back here. So I'm just going to go ahead and drag those out so they exist the whole time. All right. I need to create a little bit more of a difference between this back wall and this floor here. So I'm just going to go into this gradient again, maybe this rectangle. I want to rename this floor so I know what I'm looking at here. And I'm just going to take this color and we'll make that a little bit darker there. Okay, that looks good. Now, I want to create a little bit of movement with this group here. I can isolate individual groups by turning them on and off. So our checkbox works just like, let's say, the eye in Photoshop or in After Effects. So I can turn them individually on or off, or a whole group. And so if I wanted a clear background here, you know, I can just have it standing out there. I do this often to see how different colors hold up against different kinds of backgrounds, whether it be a light background or a dark background. I think that this purple is a little too light. I'm going to come back in here and just change it under the appearance. And we'll just make that a little bit darker there. And maybe I want to give this icon a little bit of a drop shadow too. Click on my icon, properties, drop shadow, and now it has a little bit of a drop shadow there too. I want to create a little bit more so I can give it a little bit more distance and more blur. And we'll just bump down that opacity. Okay. So as I mentioned, I want to create some movement in this group here. And in After Effects or in Final Cut or pretty much any other program, I could create keyframes. And I can do that here too. I can go under the properties of this group and I've got these little plus signs next to each one of my fields, whether it be position or rotation or scale, and I can animate it that way. However, I like using behaviors. So behaviors are almost like expressions in After Effects where they're kind of pre-built tools and movements to kind of make things happen. And notice all the different behaviors we have here. So I've got 232 different behaviors. I just wanted to do a basic motion. And we have a fade in and out, and I like I like the look of that. I have a grow shrink, so it's either going to grow or shrink. A motion path, a movement, and for us, we're just going to use a throw. And I'm going to grab this throw behavior, and I'm going to drag it right onto my text and icon. And it puts in a new layer here, and notice what's happening with this layer, is it's taking up the entire timeline. Now if I play this back, nothing's happening. Well, why isn't anything happening? I put on a, a behavior on here. Well, the behavior doesn't know what you want to do to it, so we'll have to come into the inspector. Another quick way to get to the inspector is using something called the head-up display. The head-up display, which is right here, gives us a mini inspector here. And depending on which behavior you have, it's going to look different. So they both accomplish the same thing here. So under my throw, we have throw velocity, X, Y, and Z. And in here, I've got this little arrow that's showing me where it's going to be kind of throwing things. So I can throw this to the right. And if I play this back, well, now it's moving to the right. I want it coming at me here, so I'm going to do this in 3D. And currently, I'm throwing it right at me. So there's an arrow there, but it's pointing directly at me here. So just reset that here. And now nothing's moving. Well, why isn't anything moving? Well, this is telling it I need to move it in three-dimensional space. However, I don't have any three-dimensional space. This is all two-dimensional objects. 
I just want to point out that we can move this in three-dimensional space, even though it's in two dimensions. I would just have to move the Z axis. But for our purposes, we're going to turn this into a 3D layer. So what do I mean by that? Well, we've got this little icon right here. And what these icons mean is if it's stacked like a 2D, 2D layer stack, imagine, say, Photoshop, where you have multiple layers on top of each other. You only see the uppermost, topmost layer. Or if we're working in, say, InDesign, we can arrange things front to back and stack things in order. So we're giving them a little bit of depth. And if I click on this icon, it's changed this icon here. See how they're stacked in 3D space? And same with this. And so now these are in three-dimensional space. So if I go back to my background here, I have an X and Y and a Z position. So I'm just going to push this back. And you can see what's happening. It looks like it's scaling down, but in reality, it's just pushing it further and back in space. I had a couple other things happen too. If I switch this between 2D and 3D, pay attention to what's happening here in my inspector. In 2D, I've got my drop shadow four corner crop timing. In 3D, I have some options here like lighting and reflection. So what happens if I turn on this reflection? Well, I have some weird stuff going on back here, right? It looks like it's being reflected against that back wall. And if you look on my floor here, it looks like my back wall is being reflected on my floor. I'm going to turn that off right now because I don't want to put reflections on everything. But what if I want to put a reflection on this floor here? Because the master group is in 3D, this is also in 3D. So I'm just going to go ahead and click reflection. I'm going to show that here. And I'm going to turn down some of that reflectivity some of this blur amount. I'm also going to go ahead and raise this up quite a bit, right? So we can kind of get that in here. And I'm going to do the same thing with my uh, background here. I'm just going to move that a little bit closer so we don't see those edges. And I'm going to take my text. And I'm going to push this back out in space here. And so now I'm kind of moving this pretty far back and you can see that it's reflecting in here. Now I can go ahead and take this guy, right? He's reflecting just a little bit because I had that on my floor here. If I bump up this reflectivity, we can see that. And now here's what's great about working in 3D is even though I push this back in space, I can still just scale this up. And now you can see that it's intersecting my floor there a little bit and that's okay. I'll just plop that right about here. And I'm going to come back to this floor and just adjust this reflection here. So now, remember I put on that behavior, and I can tell it has a behavior because there's a little icon here. And I can go to my behaviors, and I can see what it's doing here. Or I can open up my HUD, and if I click on Throw, and I'm just going to crank that guy up, and it looks like it's coming towards me. So this throw behavior is just scaling this up, it looks like. But it's, it's physically moving closer to this camera. And if I shorten the length of this behavior, it auto scales that movement. And so I can just go back and forth and just finesse this a little bit. This is where it's going to end. That's where I want that to end. And now I want a fade in, fade out. And so I'll just go ahead and grab that and throw that on my text and icon. And we have a new head up display and it's going to tell me, okay, it's going to take 20 frames to fade in. It's going to stay solid for however long this duration is. And then the last 20 frames are going to fade out. Well, I only want this to last maybe three seconds and same with this throw. So now this fades in as it's throwing towards me and then fades out. Now you'll notice that it pops up again right away. Well, why does it do that? Well, we told it to fade out, but then it keeps existing beyond my fade in, fade out. So if I take my text and icon or any one of my individual pieces here, 
you can see what that's doing here. And now I can play this back and it's fading in and throwing towards me. My name is Stanislaw Robert Liberta, and this has been a free tutorial to get you up and running in Apple Motion. If you're looking for more tutorials on Apple Motion, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, AV Ultra, and there you can find tutorials on After Effects, Premiere Pro, Final Cut Pro, Apple Motion, Element 3D, and many others. Thanks a lot. Hopefully you found this useful.